Welcome to Bible Study Hub. I'm Ann Wiggins. So happy to be with you tonight in the book of in our book of Genesis, like we own it, <laughs> the book of Genesis that we've been going through as a group. And we are in chapter 38 tonight. In fact, tonight, chapter 38 is almost like this parentheses in the story where something that really doesn't have anything particularly to do with what's before it or directly after it is just dropped in here as its own standalone story. So that's all we're going to do tonight is just chapter 38. We're not going to go beyond. So if it's a little short tonight, oh, well, um, I don't know if it will be or not, but that's where we're going to be landing. So just to catch us up, last week we talked about how Joseph's brothers conspired to actually murder their brother. They were so jealous of him. He had shared these dreams with them about how it looked like in the dream that they would someday bow down to him. They were furious about it. The dad, Jacob, sends Joseph out to check on the brothers. Not his best idea ever. They see him coming. They conspire to kill him. And then Judah says, well, actually, Reuben steps in and says, let's not kill him. Let's just throw him in the pit. And then Reuben's thought to himself is, I'll run off. I'll come back later. I will pull him out of the pit and then I will figure out what to do. But in the meantime, Judah has an idea, which is, why would we kill him when we could actually get money out of this by selling him? So without Reuben there, they sell him to a group of traders, some Ishmaelites, for the price of a slave, 20 pieces of silver. And off he goes. So Reuben comes back. He finds out he's he's lost his brother. He's gone. And now all of a sudden, it's like it dawns on them. Ooh, what are we going to tell dad when we get home? And this is kind of where we ended last week, if you remember. They decided to take his beautiful cloak that his father had given him that was a sign of his authority and, and of that firstborn status. They shred it up, they kill a goat, they dip it all in the goat's blood so their, their dad will have no idea that it's an animal and, and not his son's blood. They take it back to their dad and they, they give it to him and they say, see, here, please identify this robe. Whose is this? Is this your son Joseph's robe? And of course, Jacob knows exactly whose robe it is. And he says, oh my goodness, a wild animal has surely devoured him. I will never see him again. And he sits down to mourn and everybody tries to comfort him and he will not be comforted. There was a certain amount of time for mourning and then they were expected to move on with their lives. And, and Jacob says, I will never stop mourning. I will go to my grave mourning for my son. So here's their dad, devastated beyond words. And we, we just kind of ended by saying, it seemed like such a great idea to them when they were doing this. But now all of a sudden they've got a new problem on their hands. That is dad is beside himself. And it, by his own choice and admission, he says, I will never recover from this. You're going to have to sit and listen to me weep and wail for the rest of your life because I will do this until my grave. So things did not go well. All right. So that's where we stopped. Now, as I said, we've got this little parentheses in the story. But before we start reading in chapter 38, just a couple things that I want you to know. First of all, you already know this, but just as a reminder, this story occurs prior to any written word of God. In other words, the Bible does not exist as a written document yet. Not even part of the Bible exists as a written document yet. So everything that anybody knows specifically about God, I'm not talking about general, what we call general revelation, where we can look at, we can say there has to be a creator. There's no way this came from nowhere. We can see various attributes of God in creation. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about specifics about God that are only known if he chooses to disclose them. All of those are only known if God actually speaks to somebody and tells them. We saw cases of this just really, really briefly, way back in the beginning of Genesis. Do you remember um, when Eve was talking to the serpent who was like, no, go ahead and eat from the fruit of that tree that God said not to eat from? And she said, no, God said, don't eat from it and don't even touch it. And we said at the time, there's no record of God saying that. However, I mean, the touching part, however, Eve could not have been lying because she had not yet sinned. She was not fallen. So lying was out of the question. And the only other possibility on that line is that like she's really stupid and she has no idea what God said, which we also would say, no, she's perfect. God made her absolutely perfect. So he's not stupid. So the only other alternative is that unbeknownst to us, because it's not written, God really did tell them, don't touch it. Uh, you can just hear him, right? 
don't eat of it. Listen, just don't touch it. If you never touch it, you'll never eat it. Well, of course they do anyway. We had the same situation with Cain and Abel, where Abel just happens, happens to bring the perfect sacrifice that God requires later on in the Old Testament in written code. And Cain just happens not to bring at all the right sacrifice. And God accepts Abel's and rejects Cain. And we said at the time, how did Abel know to bring that? God must have told him. So all of that little background there, just to say, we're going to encounter something real quickly here where we're going to say, even though it's not written down that God told somebody to do it this way, just piecing it together, he had to have. He just had to have told them because this is not stuff that people just kind of like come up with on their own and just, oh, wow, it's like winning the lottery. You happen to get exactly what God wanted you to do and, and you just happened on it. Probably not. So there's that. One more tiny little thing and then I promise we'll get rolling. One other thing we're going to look for in chapter 38 is that God will make very clear to Judah, I saw what you did to your brother Joseph without saying a word. We said last week, if you ever had that moment where it's like God pulls you aside away from other people, nobody else knows, but you know that he's letting you know, I saw that. I heard that. And you're like, okay, I got it. I got it. We're going to have that tonight too. So let's pick it up in chapter 38 now. Come on in. If you're just joining us, we're just getting rolling. Genesis 38, one to six. It happened at that time that Judah went down from his brothers and turned aside to a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. There Judah saw the, um, saw the daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. He took her and went into her. And she conceived and bore a son, and he called his name Ur. So if you're having a baby, you need a good name, Ur is available. She conceived again and bore a son, and she called his name Onan. Yet again she bore a son, and she called his name Shelah. Judah was in Kezib when she bore him. And Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. Now, that's an important name in this story. So it was customary in this day that the father would, or father and mother sometimes, would choose the, the bride for his son. But Judah doesn't do that. Judah goes and gets his own bride. However, when it's time for Judah's sons to get married, Judah steps in and picks their wives. I just thought that was kind of an interesting thing. So anyway, Judah marries a Canaanite woman. She has three sons. Let's keep going. Verses 7 to 8. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord put him to death. Then Judah said to Onan, go into your brother's wife and perform the duty of a brother-in-law to her and raise up offspring for your brother. So Ur gets executed by God for being wicked. Now, just an observation, just an observation. Remember that Judah convinced, not just tried to, he actually did convince his father that his father lost his son, Joseph. Now we know because we have the backstory that Jacob actually didn't lose his son, Joseph to death. He was sold. But as far as Judah was concerned, he might as well be dead because that's what he told his father. And I just, again, I, I could be wrong, but I'm, I'm just observing that God says to Judah, I'm taking your son. Judah took his father's son, and God takes Judah's son. Is there a correlation? Maybe. I just wonder. But let's go to what is more obvious here, and that is what on earth is going on here with this whole marry your, you know, your your husband's brother thing and and have children. What was that all about? Well, later on in the book of Deuteronomy, so this is hundreds of years later, when the law is actually codified and written down, there was something that we call leveret marriage. I used to think leveret had something to do with like the tribe of Levi because it kind of looks the same. Turns out it's from a Latin word that means like uh, brother-in-law. So nothing to do with Levi. But leveret marriage was just simply this. I'll try to put it as simple as I can. Back in this day and, and forward, especially with the tribes of Israel, God wanted to preserve the family lineage. So if a woman, as in the case of Tamar here, marries a man and they do not have a son and the man dies, then it is the responsibility by God's um, command of that 
man who died for his brother to take the widow as his own wife. And then the very first son that they have technically belongs to, legally belongs to the brother who died who never had a child. So that son would carry on his name, the deceased father's name, even though it wasn't technically his dad, he would carry on that family lineage and anything having to do with that oldest brother. Now, any other children that were born after that, they all belonged to the younger brother who, who married the widow. Does that make sense? So this is something that was definitely put into place. If you want to read it, if you're interested, it's Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses five to six. It really goes through. And it was considered heinous to not do this. God absolutely prescribed it. He expected it. And it wasn't optional. You didn't just say, yeah, I don't really like her. I think I'll pass on that. My brother did not have good taste in women. I don't want her. You, you just were not to do that. So this was something that, again, marriage at this time was much more of an arranged situation, had much less to do with actual love and romance and much more to do with a whole lot of other things. So this is a really, really big deal that they are to do this. So let's go on and see what happens. Chapter 38, verses 9 to 10. But Onan knew that the offspring, firstborn, would not be his. So this is gross, but here we go. So whenever he went into his brother's wife, he would waste his semen on the ground. Okay, I don't have to explain that. We all know what that means. So as not to give offspring to his brother. And what he did was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and he put him to death also, now this is why I really believe that God had actually instructed the Hebrews to do this, because if it were just a cultural thing, just something that they kind of thought was a good idea, then to not do it would not have deserved the death penalty. But if God had specifically communicated this to, I don't know, was it Abraham? Was it Isaac? Was it Jacob? I don't know which one. One of these people got this message from God directly. And Onan says, you can't make me. I'm not doing it. I'll get out of it. And so he makes sure that she never gets pregnant and God takes him out. And again, is it coincidental or is God trying to send a primary message to Judah? Judah took one son from his father. God just took two from him. He got double the recompense. I don't know. It just seems a little too coincidental to me. Verse 11, then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow in your father's house till Shelah, my son, grows up. And then it gives us kind of like what's churning in Judah's mind here. For he feared that he would die like his brothers. So Tamar went and remained in her father's house. Now, being a widow, not a good thing in this day. I mean, it's, it's never fun. It's never good. But it's particularly bad in this day. And the reason is that the women depended so much on the men for their care, their homes, their food, everything. They couldn't just go out and get a job like we can today. There was no social security. There was no money in the bank for later. Everything was kind of in the now. And so if a woman had no son to take care of her and she lost her husband, she was considered pretty destitute. So, so what Judah does here is he says, hey, my son, Shayla, next in line, um, he's not quite old enough to marry you yet. Now, how old do you think Shayla was? Well, again, the Bible doesn't really give us ages here. However, if Shayla was like three years old, then by the time he got old enough to marry her, she would be past childbearing years. So it would be a moot point. So the fact that it's anticipated that he will marry her and that they will have a son tells me he was probably in his teens. He was probably a year or two, maybe at the most three, away from marrying age. It's even possible he was already basically at marrying age, but kind of on the young side. And Judah's like, I just want to hold off for a little. Let's let him grow up a little bit more. Oh, he's so immature. And the reason he says that is rather than taking responsibility for the fact that he raised really wicked sons, so wicked that God had to kill them, he blames his daughter-in-law instead. It's her fault. Everybody who marries her dies. I don't want my youngest son to die. Therefore, I will lie to her, keep her as a widow, put her in her father's house. She's gone. My son can grow up and we'll just sort of like forget that whole deal. 
not okay. All right, let's go on to verses 12 to 14. In the course of time, the wife of Judah, Shua's daughter, died. When Judah was comforted, that mourning period of time that they had, he went up to Timnah to his sheep shearers, and he and his friend Hira the Adulamite. And when Tamar was told, or Tamar, I think is how you pronounce it in Hebrew, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep, she took off her widow's garments and covered herself with a veil, wrapping herself up, and sat at the entrance to Enaim, which is on the road to Timnah. For she saw that Shelah was grown up, and she had not been given to him in marriage. So this Tamar is a smart cookie. She realizes that the, the gig is up. I mean, she knows she's not going to be married to Shayla, and she knows that she's not going to be released to go marry somebody else, and nobody's going to want her anyway because everybody who marries her dies. So she's in a terrible spot. Also, what Judah is not thinking about and probably doesn't even realize or know in the grand scheme of things and the plan of God is that it is his tribe, the tribe of Judah, that the future Messiah will come through. He has to have a son. He has to, or this whole thing is off. So God is going to use sinful human beings doing crazy things to bring about his sovereign will in the end. And that is our God. He is that incredible. So she springs into action. She has a crazy plan that she has hatched. She takes off her widow's garments and she puts on the garments of basically a prostitute, puts a veil over her face, which would have been what they did in those days. And then she goes to sit along the road where she knows her future father-in-law will be coming down. Let's see if he falls for it. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. He turned to her at the roadside and said, come, let me come into you. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. She said, what will you give me that you may come into me? He answered, I will send you a young goat from the flock. And she said, if you give me a pledge until you send it. He said, what pledge shall I give you? She's like, I need collateral here. I'm not going to trust you for this. She replied, your signet and your cord and your staff that is in your hand. So he gave them to her and went into her and she conceived by him. Then she arose and went away, taking off her veil. She put on the garments of her widowhood. I thought it was really interesting here that Judah has not spent enough time with his daughter-in-law after all these years that he even recognized her voice. It's not something. I mean, here's this woman. She's lost two husbands. He sends her off to live with her dad and he's done with her. So that when she speaks, remember when, when uh, Jacob, no, sorry, <laughs> I'm getting all confused here. Who's the guy that got tricked? Isaac. When Isaac was told by Jacob that he was actually Esau and, and he had put the goat skins on his arms. And remember what Isaac said? He's like, I'm so confused because I'm feeling Esau's arms, but the voice is Jacob's. Well, here, Judah isn't like, wait a minute, you sound familiar. He doesn't talk to her. He doesn't care about her. He doesn't have anything to do with her. He doesn't even recognize her voice. Wow. So he wants to pay her with a goat. It's a bartering society. I know that sounds absolutely ridiculous, but that's what they did back then. It wasn't so much cash. It was a lot more bartering. So he's like, ah, I got a goat. I'll give you a goat. And she goes, well, yeah, I don't trust you. So um, I'm going to need some stuff from you too. I'm going to need your signet. I'm going to need your cord and I'm going to need your staff. So let's talk about what these are. It's really, really fascinating. And I've got some pictures for you that I think will make it really come to life. So the seal or the signet was basically the equivalent of like your own signature today. It carried authority with it. If you if you had hot wax or, or clay that was going to dry and you made the imprint of your seal or your signet in that, that was as good as a legal signature would be today. It was one of a kind. It was all yours. It carried with it the authority of whatever authority that you had. So let me show you a picture. Let me grab that real quick. This, okay, this one I love. This is the imprint of a seal. It's not the seal. 
It is the clay imprint that archaeologists uncovered, I believe it was in 2009 over in Israel, and it is the seal of King Hezekiah of the tribe of Judah. Oh, this is like 600 years before the birth of Christ that he would have been reigning in Judah. That is the imprint of his seal. Isn't that something? It's so ornate. Took them a while to figure out whose it was. So you can see it's kind of a round one. It very well may have been on his ring that he would have put into there or something like that. But there were other ways of doing seals. This is a rolling seal. It's stone. It has a hole through the middle of it. And you can see it's kind of like a rolling pin, you know, you roll it across clay or hot wax and it leaves whatever is engraved in it onto the clay or the hot wax. While you're looking at that, let me just say this. He, she also demanded that he give her his cord and his staff. I had never put this together, and I'm not saying that what I'm about to show you is what it looked like, but I think it's an interesting proposition that it may have looked like this. His staff would have been ornate, not just the tree branch he had found somewhere, because he's a very wealthy man. This is, by the way, not excavated. This is something that somebody like currently has carved and made, so it's not archaic. But you can see what it might have been. So maybe the cord was his belt, sure. But what if it was something like this? What if it was one unit where he carried his seal on his staff by a cord and she looks at that and she goes, all of that is one of a kind. The seal, the cord, and the staff, I want that unit. You give me that and you've got a deal. I don't know. Is that what it looked like or not? But I think it's very interesting. So he gives it to her. Okay, got a question for you guys. What was he thinking? Why was, go ahead and start typing. Why was Judah willing to let this, what he thought was a prostitute, have his personal items? I mean, your seal, it's kind of like giving somebody your checkbook. Like, hold on to my checkbook and I'll be back with a goat. Yeah, probably not. Take my credit card. <laughs> I'll come back for that later and bring you something different. Why, why would Judah ever do something like this? Anxious to hear what you have to say. I've been so thirsty today. I think it's just dry outside. Very cold here, dry air. All right, we do have a bit of a delay, about 23 seconds, as I determined at the beginning here. But anxious to hear what you have to say. Because I really did put some thought into this, and I'm like, just can't think of a good reason to do this. This is nuts. Somebody's saying women had no power. Oh, I think he thought he could easily get it back from a dumb prostitute. Oh, that's good. I never thought about that. So even if she'd wanted to use it, she can't use it because women didn't own those types of things. They didn't have that. Excellent. Dottie says at that point, he just was not thinking <laughs> instant gratification. I thought about that too, Dottie. And I just thought, well, he obviously he has trouble with impulsive actions. And maybe this is just so impulsive that he's, he's not thinking right now. Roberta says, maybe Judah did know who she was. That's an interesting point. I um, almost called you Judah. I'm so sorry, Roberta. The only thing I would disagree on that is that it says in the scripture that he didn't know who she was. And we're going to find out in a few more verses, he really did not know who she was, but I can see where you would come up with that. And that was a great guess. Anybody else have anything that they want to conjecture? It's just hard to imagine, isn't it? I guess when it comes to, honestly, the sexual sins, there tends to be kind of um, a, a drive for that type of sin that is not necessarily congruent with just other basic types of sins. Sexual sins tends to be a little over the top with like not thinking of consequences and going for it. All right. Well, we'll keep going here. Let's see. Verses 20 to 23. When Judah sent the young goat by his friend, the Adulamite, to take back the pledge, the staff, the gourd, and the signet from the woman's hand, he did not find her. And he asked the men of the place, where is the cult prostitute who was at Enaim at the roadside? And they said, no cult prostitute has been here. 
So he returned to Judah and said, I have not found her. Also, the men of the place said, no cult prostitute has been here. And Judah replied, let her keep the things as her own, or we shall be laughed at. Remember those words. We shall be laughed at. We'll be humiliated. We'll be embarrassed. You see, I sent this young goat and you did not find her. He goes, I tried to keep up my end of the gar of the bargain here. Couldn't do it. The cult prostitutes, by the way, were involved in the pagan religion, like the temple worship. Often, very often involved cult prostitutes. And that was part of their so-called worship to their little G gods, who, as we said a million times, are really demons. And so it all kind of starts to make sense. So he just figured that she was just a Canaanite prostitute for, uh, you know, the ritual temple worship. And, and then they can't find her. And this guy asks around and they're like, there's no cult prostitute around here. Could you imagine what they thought? Judah and his friend, like, who was that? <laughs> How did that happen? Okay. And, and Judah, like I said, he's like, mm, we're just going to leave that one lay. Apparently, that was not a good idea for me to leave with her, but I would rather lose it than have anybody know what happened. So I'm not going to go after this. Now, before we read the next little bit, I want to remind you of something that we read last week. Back in chapter 37, verse 32, this is after the brothers shredded the robe, dipped it in the goat's blood, took it to their dad so that he would think that it was Joseph's. This is that moment. And they sent the robe of many colors and brought it to their father and said, this we have found. This is what I said last week. Underline, highlight this because it's going to come back. Please identify whether it is your son's robe or not. Please identify whether this is your son's robe or not. Judah, 100% involved in asking that question. Now, back to chapter 38 and, and see this. Verses 24 to 25. About three months later, Judah was told, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has been immoral. Moreover, she is pregnant by immorality. And Judah said, bring her out and let her be burned. As she was being brought out, she sent word to her father-in-law. And this is what she said, by the man to whom these belong, I am pregnant. And she said, please identify who these are, the signet and the corn cord and the staff. Is this just another moment where God just very quietly lets Judah know, I heard you say that because Judah said that to his, those very words to his dad. See, I see if you can identify, is this your son's robe? And she says, see if you can identify, did it ring a bell with him? I think maybe it did. And, and quite honestly, I think this is a bit of a turning point in Judah's life right now. He's been a really bad guy up until now. And fortunately, God has not taken him out as he did his wicked sons, although God had every right to. He was merciful to Judah and didn't kill him. But I think we see a bit of a softening that is about to occur. Let's go on to verse 26. Then Judah identified them and said, she is more righteous than I since I did not give to her my son, Shayla, and he did not know her again. So, so he, the gig is up. He was such a hypocrite. Even though he had known he was immoral too, he was commanding that she be burned alive because apparently that was in that culture or at that time, what they did to immoral women. But notice what he says here. She is more righteous than I. If you flip that around, it's like saying, I am worse than a prostitute. That sounds like repentance to me. I am a worse sinner than this woman who dressed up as a, as a prostitute. Wow. And then it also says, and he did not know her again. He could have. He could have said, well, it doesn't matter now. I mean, we might as well be married because she's pregnant with my kid. So whether we get married or not, you know, whatever, I'm just, I'm going to enjoy the physical relationship with her. He doesn't do that. So, so again, I'm, it doesn't say explicitly, but I'm looking at this and I'm going, it seems to me that there's a bit of a softening here. There's a bit of repentance. I say a bit and not completely because what we don't read is that he goes to his father and says, 
I'm, I'm on a roll. I need to repent of everything. And there's stuff I need to tell you about your son, Joseph. He does not do that. He continues to allow his father to think that Joseph is dead. Well, against all odds, Tamar's plan worked. And she is going to be responsible now for carrying the future <laughs> lineage, in the lineage, I should say, of the upcoming Messiah. If you ever have read the beginning of the book of Matthew, you will find that her name is in that lineage. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. But before we do, let's finish this chapter up. When the time of her labor came, there were twins in her womb. And when she was in labor, one put out a hand and the midwife took and tied a scarlet thread on his hand saying, this one came out first. What a smart thing to do. It's really important who the firstborn is, right? So she ties, you know, the little hand comes out. You can see her really quickly tying that little thread on. And then, surprise, verse 29, but as he drew back his hand, behold, his brother came out. And she said, what a breach you have made for yourself. Therefore, his name was called Perez, which is breach. Afterward, his brother came out with the scarlet thread on his hand. And his name was called Zara. And there you go. Perez is the descendant of Jesus Christ on Joseph's side. Now, to that little passage in Matthew, actually, let me let me read that to you. It's really fascinating. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. And Isaac, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. There are only two women mentioned in this genealogy, only two, because it really didn't technically matter who the woman was. It's not like women don't matter. It's just for the purposes of what that genealogy was to accomplish. The women weren't instrumental in accomplishing that. So Ruth the Moabitess, if you've read the book of Ruth, you know who that is. But I have a question, and we're going to end with this question tonight. Why do you think that Tamar's name was included in that lineage in the book of Matthew? Anxious to hear what you have to say about that. Of, of all the names, only two women. Ruth, pretty easy to ascertain. If you know the story, Ruth was amazing. She was incredible. She was a Moabitess. She converted to Judaism. She would not leave her mother-in-law, even though her husband had died and her mother-in-law said, go back to your own people. She wanted to stay with her mother-in-law and accept the God of Judaism. Amazing woman. I can see why God might put her in there. But why would he put in this one, Tamar? How did that woman make it in? I'm asking you really hard questions tonight. Hmm. Not sure. All right. Can't wait to see what you have to say about that. I'm just reading some of your other comments that I, yeah, that I missed earlier. Um, Emily's saying, I wonder if God spoke to Tamar. Her role was so intentional. Interesting point. I mean, we're not told that he did. Um, he definitely was involved, wasn't he, in his sovereign way of making this all come to work out. That's a really great thought. That he says, to show God can use anyone to accomplish his plan. Oh, I love that. It definitely does that for us, doesn't it? I don't know where you've been or what has happened in your life or the things that weigh on you from your past, maybe some things that you've done that you're not proud of and, and you've confessed it to the Lord. Maybe you feel like you're kind of washed up now. He can't use you. You know what? Repentance is what God is looking for, and a repentant heart can be used by him always. In some way, shape, or form, he will use you if you are um, repentant of what you've done. Oh, real quiet out there, but I don't blame you because I'm asking such hard questions. I'm not sure I would be commenting if I were you because I would. I don't know. I don't know why he included her, but she seemed to act on faith as far as she knew what the what the protocol was, what God had laid down, that she was supposed to get another husband from Judah, that she wasn't going to get it. And she took matters into her own hands and she made it happen. Of course, the Lord was all involved in actually making sure that she got pregnant, but that was, that was her thing. Roberta said she gave birth to two sons from Judah. 
shows even when there is sin, God can still use us as we re- and when we repent. Yeah. Amen. That's a wonderful one to end on. So I think we'll just end with that. It's a little bit of a shorter study this week, but like I said, I didn't want to go outside chapter 38 because it it's just its own encapsulated, amazing story. And if you take nothing else from it, I hope that you will continue to be amazed at the sovereignty of our all-powerful God, how he cannot be thwarted. And as we said last week, he will either work with and through you, or he will work despite and around you and without you, but he will accomplish his will. He will. That was a lot of wills in one sentence. He is bound to accomplish his will no matter what. A little clearer. All right. Well, I will see you next Monday night, Lord willing, at 9 p.m. Eastern time on Bible Study Hub here on Facebook and also on YouTube. Don't forget, you can catch any video that you've missed. I think we have like 185 or something Bible studies now on Bible Study Hub. So lots of things to listen to if you're ever just driving and you want something to listen to, tune in and catch something that you've missed. In the meantime, I love you. I pray for you. And I'm so grateful that you joined us tonight. And I hope you have a wonderful week. Oh, and have a very happy Thanksgiving. And I hope you all do. And I will see you um, next Monday night. Bye.